to Matthew chapter 16 again. I will not stay there long. I will just read the one verse again. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. For our Lord is speaking here specifically unto Peter. He's certainly saying this to all yes, sir. the disciples that were with him there. But he says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ declared, I will build my church. Amen. Build my church. The whole thought of the word build to any believer's mind and hearing the Lord of glory saying that yeah. knows that this is no slipshod thing as I've That's said right. before. Yeah. Sure. Now, last week I talked about the church's organization <coughs> And the main theme was oneness. Yes, sir. Oneness. You remember from Ephesians 4. One. One. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. Yes, sir. But now I want to talk about the church's organization. And one of the words I will use is this. Order. Yes, sir. Order. Now let me reemphasize. I'm not talking about the church being an organization. That's not what I'm talking about. The word organization means arrangement, structure, not a structure, but structure, yeah. order. Anyone who has been trained and has some experience <coughs> in building knows that you must build in a certain way Sorry. if it's to be built properly. So when I say the church's organization, I mean it in that light, arrangement, structure, and order. That's the meaning of the word organization. That word's not used there. But when you build, and when Christ builds, we can rest assured He's doing it according to arrangement, structure, and order. But the word also implies, that's organization, implies coherence and union yeah. coherence and union that's why I use the word this morning the church's organization order some of these terms are actually directly used and expressed in scripture concerning the church and I want to give you several things about eight but I want to try to be brief on them but we'll see how that goes so as I said some of these terms are directly expressed in scripture concerning the church Paul told Titus, he said, I left you in Crete to set in order yeah. the things that were wanting. Exactly. The whole meaning of that phrase, especially as manifested in the Greek language, is to straighten further that which is lacking. Yeah. Or to make needed corrections the church is perfect in Christ yes, sir. but only perfect in Christ Amen. we are one and at unity in Christ yes, sir. but only in Christ Amen. the church local in all of its local assemblies being made up of men and women, regenerated though they may be, and converted though they may be. And I say that because the local assembly also has imposters in it. The church universal has no imposters in it. But the church local has imposters in it. Some know they are imposters. Others are deceived and don't realize they are imposters. But be that as it may, the church being made up of believing men and women is made up of imperfect men and women. And that's why I believe is one of the reasons Paul, before he speaks of that great oneness, you know, one this, one that, one everything, he still says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because he's speaking, he was speaking to, and those words still relate to imperfect men and women. So Paul said I, I leave you and I left you in Crete to, to, to set in order the things that were 
wanting, and to ordain elders in every city. So to this order we see is to straighten further what is lacking, to make needed corrections. One thing here, let us never think that simply because we've always done something this way, that that makes it right. Exactly. But at the same time, let us never be so rebellious yeah. that we say we don't need change. Mm -hmm. right. We right. don't change for change's sake. Exactly. And we dare not change to be conformed to this world no. that we might have the results that this world looks for in numbers or whatever it might be. Yeah. But never let, never let us be afraid of change when we realize the Word of God warrants that change. Yeah, there you go. Mason and I talked a little bit about this the other day. It's easy to fall into the trap of, and this applies to me and everyone else, but I've always understood it that way or this way. Yeah. That's perfectly valid if your understanding was right in accord with the Word of God. But if our understanding is discovered to be wrong, then by God's grace may He bow us That's it. to things being needed to be set in order. Yeah. It's also used, the word another word uh, for order is used, regular arrangement or official dignity. Yeah. Paul spoke of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40. And let me just read that verse uh, so you get the idea of what I'm talking about here. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. That is regular arrangement. Yes, sir. If you go back, one of the first times this word is used is back in Luke chapter 1 of John the Baptist's father who was a priest. So go to Luke chapter 1 and we'll get an idea of... Uh, and as one preacher once said the, the law of first mention is very important yeah. especially in the scripture Luke chapter 1 and just a little bit of the context verse 7 and they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years that this is John the Baptist mother and father and it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office because God uh, before God in the order of his course. In other words, in the Old Testament it's clear, especially as seen in the law and the worship of God under that Old Covenant, everything was ordered specifically, designed and arranged by God specifically. It had structure to it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, you remember one of the preachers mentioned it yesterday. It may have been Gabe. I don't remember exactly uh, correctly for sure or not but speaking you remember the the deal with Uzzah yeah when they were bringing the ark of the covenant back yeah. and according to the structure the arrangement the order of the law it was to be carried on the shoulders of the priest with the staves in the rings yes sir but david had this new idea yeah we'll use oxen that's never pulled anything which was a bad idea to start with. And we'll, use, we'll make a brand new cart and this will be a glorious thing. And as the oxen stumbled, the cart evidently began to shift back and forth and that ark began to evidently sway and us a wretch up. An honorable thing, yeah. wouldn't you think? But he wretch up to steady the ark and God struck the man dead. Yes, sir. Why? Because they did it not according to do order. Exactly. Now that's what we read here. Yeah. Let all things be done decently and what? In order. Yeah. We're not talking simply about using religious rites. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what Paul's talking about here. But it is regular arrangement. Yes, sir. It is to do something with official dignity. When we gather here, we gather to worship the Lord of glory. Exactly. I'm not saying we can't laugh and enjoy one another's company and that kind of thing, but we are gathered here to worship the eternal God. Yes, sir. And this eternal God is a God of order and arrangement and structure. 
And it should be engaged in with official dignity. Official dignity. So much so that this is why we read, Paul uses the word again, that is this other Greek word for order in Colossians chapter 2. And he writes these words to the believers at Colossae. And they're sound words for us. Chapter 2, For I would that you knew what great conflict I had for you for them at Laodicea. And, you know, when you then read, and you know, if, uh, I, can, I can imagine Joe him writing this to them and thinking, yes, our brothers and sisters in Laodicea. Yeah. But then when you read the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ and what Christ said to the church at Laodicea, you know something went wrong terribly somewhere. Yeah. Did it not? I mean, even so much that Christ was saying to some, I I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Uh, that's striking. And Joe a little frightful. To them that it lay on sea, and, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together. And see, there you see the, what I say, the coherence and the union. Yeah. Their hearts being knit together in love. You don't find this out there in pseudo Christianity. Yeah. You do not find the coherence and the order and the union that, you, that is manifest amidst the people of God. You just don't do it. And the religious world, pseudo-Christianity, just don't get it. It's like water off a duck's back or the old friend right over their head. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and into all riches of the full assurance of understanding. So understanding is beneficial because it'll do what? Full assurance. You, you can't be fully assured of something that you're not quite sure of. Full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I listened to a little bit of the radio this morning before our broadcast came on and it was an announcement by the Salvation Army that said, in the Bible is where most wisdom is found. <laughs> really? Most wisdom is found there? I'm glad they found that out. All wisdom is found there. Wisdom will be found nowhere else other than in God's Word. But it is personified in the person of the Son. In whom, notice that, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, Yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your, what? Order. Order. And steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye therefore, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Rooted and built up in Him. Established in the faith. And so forth and so on. So it means to straighten further that which is lacking. To make needed corrections. It means to walk in, to stand firm in the regular arrangement and to do so with official dignity. Yes, sir. This is not a sports arena exactly. where we're merely here to hoop and holler about something we really like real well. This is about the worship and the praise and the adoration of God as manifest in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. But thirdly, it means to arrange thoroughly, to institute or prescribe. And you'll see that word used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, specifically verse 34, where he corrects irregularities, even dangerous irregularities, concerning the table of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, yeah. They, they, they were making it into a, a David a drunken feast. Yeah. I mean, that, that ought to have been the furthest thing from their mind. Exactly. And yet here a church. Yeah, that's right. One of the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ right. had let the table of the Lord denigrate into a drunken feast. Yes, sir. Paul says, the rest will I set in order when I come. <laughs> so evidently there were some other problems there. Exactly. Right? Yeah. The rest, will I sit in order, I'll arrange it thoroughly. We'll institute this thing and prescribe it the way it ought to be prescribed. Yes, sir. 
Now he was an apostle being given direction by Christ. Christ spoke specifically with him. I'm not an apostle. I don't have that office. I'm not one of those gifts. Right here is all we have today. That's right. And this book, this word, is the rule of our faith and our practice. There you go. Yes, sir. You remember, turn back, I'm not going to turn there, but turn back there for me to Judges chapter 17 just a moment. And I will not fully get to what I was wanting to get to, but I'm wanting to lay the foundation. Remember the church's organization. There's order here. There's arrangement here. Yes, sir. Even in the way we conduct the Lord's table. Now, Mason, there's a lot of things about it. We're not told, so we're at liberty to do it as best we know how in a good conscience. Yeah. But there are other things we're told. He said, you got houses to eat in, you eat in your house. That's right. Don't make this table a drunken feast. The rest of it I'll set in order when I come That's as an right. illustration of what I'm talking about. But go to, you in Judges 17, now now go to verse 6. There's a phrase there, and it's used, I think, another time. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Oh, yeah. You remember that phrase? But look why. Do you see the first yes, sir. few words? Oh, yeah. And there was no king in Israel. And this is why men do what is right in their own eyes. This is why the so-called church today, pseudo-Christianity, I believe it's a false church. Mason, I believe it's so far removed from the truth, you can't even really call it a church. Exactly. Why is it that it's so disordered? Why is it that this book doesn't matter to them? Why is it that the steadfastness of the faith in Christ does not matter to them? Because there's no king in that church. That's right. That's why. And when there is no king to rule and to reign, what do the subjects do? They turn to total anarchy. They begin to do that which is right in their own eyes. Thank God, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, of the church, Christ is the head, and he is preeminent in all things to the church. Seeing that we have a king, we have order. We have structure. We have arrangement. And we like it that way. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. You see, a true believer likes it that way. Because I am reminded of back yonder, <coughs> Joe, when I wasn't in my right mind. Oh, yeah. And even David of my flesh now, of how much it rebelled against order and structure. I wanted to do that which was right in my own eyes. But now I know there is the superior way. The superior way. So let us never think that this thing is just some wild, cut loose, do what everybody and anybody wants to do. It ain't that way. Right. Is it? I mean, we're we're even told, you know, about working. I mean, I've mentioned this before in and I know, I know there are there are exemptions, but they're not exemptions to the rule. Yeah. They're just exemptions. You know, Paul said, if a man don't work, yeah. he's not to eat. And if he walks around disorderly and is a busybody, then you don't you don't 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 treat him like he's not a brother. But you better exhort him and warn him. Yeah. And remember, Paul even told Titus about the Cretans. He said one of their own prophets says they're always evil beasts and slow bellies. He wasn't very politically correct, I'll tell you that. But what did he say? This witness is true. (laughs) You know, it's a fact. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So order, arrangement, structure is necessary. Why? Because God knows how we're so prone to scatter oh, yeah. to do our own thing. Oh, yeah. Don't we? Yeah, exactly. That's why. But for the believer, we desire to have it so. Yes. Because I still know how prone I am to want it my own way. And he's allowed me to see. He suffered me to see. And suffered himself to put up with. Sometimes letting me have just enough cord, Mason, or rope to hang myself, so to speak. Exactly. But thank God, aren't you glad he's got the noose around your neck? Yeah. Well, that means you can't go but so far. Yeah. 
You ever had a choke collar on a dog? I know the SPCA may not like this message since I mentioned this. What's it do? It constrains. Yeah. It restrains. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's what it takes. Yes, sir. Sometimes that's what it takes. But nevertheless, I say, we desire it. Now, if that is totally offensive to you, then you're not a believer. I don't care. Now, this is a small group to preach to and to say that. But a person who doesn't want it to be so doesn't believe God. But there is also coherence and union. There is coherence and union established by Christ. And I'm just going to read some of these, make a few statements, because I definitely want to at least get started on the, the summing thing of this, the church's organization order. There is coherence and union established by Christ. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2. Yeah. And many of these passages I've already mentioned to us. I've already went over them. Some of them in, in, in detail to some degree. Verse 19, There therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. He's writing to Gentiles. Yes, sir. Yes, sir who are now, have experienced, I should say, being a part of the body of Christ, the church. Now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together. In other words, he's not just throwing up a few two-befores here and there. That's right. If I can now speak of a stick building, which I said the church is not a stick building, but but he's not just throwing up a few little walls here and there and say, boy, well, that, that's all right. I don't know. It's fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are also builded together. Yes. Now think about this. Yeah. For an habitation of God through the Spirit. God is not just up there. He is. Yes, sir. Father and Son. Amen. But God the Spirit is where? In here. In this physical body. Yes, sir. Huh? What an amazing thing to contemplate. So there is coherence and union established by Christ. Secondly, there is coherence and union in the, in the body which is to be guarded. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, you see, we must be careful lest we get on this... And I've done lost the word... What is it when you just... Something's inevitable, but it's just going to happen, but it doesn't matter. Well, somebody fate. help me. Fate. fate. Yeah, fate. We must, this, that's the word. We must be careful lest we have this fatalistic outlook on things. That's right. Because remember, the church is manifested, manifested, manifested in its local aspect. Yes, sir. And it is not perfect in its local aspect. And we must fight against that imperfection constantly. Yes, sir. But anyway, let me go but there is coherence and union in the body which is to be guarded. First Corinthians twelve. Did I tell you that already? Are you there? In verse twenty four and twenty five. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together. Do you see that? It's not an arm over here and a leg over there and a foot down yonder. It's a body. Yes sir. It's not pieces in a morgue. Yeah. yeah, that's what pseudo Christianity is yeah. at best. Yeah. Tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked. And say, but well, why would he have the, some parts lack? Why, that's his business. He put us in the body as it pleased him. Yes, sir. And if you don't have what somebody else has, quit complaining against God. Be thankful for what He did give you. He could have left you without the building and without the body. We don't deserve to be a part of the body. That's right. yeah. I mean, believe you me, as a preacher of the gospel for 30 years, there are times when I find my flesh rising up and murmuring and complaining. And then I'm ashamed of myself. Exactly. But that there be no schism in the body. 
Do you see it? It needs to be guarded. You see? That's right. That there be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Amen. So there is coherence and union in the body, which is to be what? Guarded. Yes, sir. Guarded. Thirdly, there is coherence and union to our mutual benefit. I've read this one to you, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 16, From whom the whole body fitly joined together yes, sir. and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Now yes, all of our sustenance comes initially, mm -hmm. intrinsically, yeah. from the head. Yes, sir. But just as a body works, the head, the, all the body is not connected directly to the head. The body, the head's a part of it. It's there. Blood throw, flows all throughout the body. Right. Nourishment goes all throughout the body. And different parts help other parts. That which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Amen. You see it? That is, there is coherence and mun uh, union <coughs> to our mutual benefit. We need one another. Yes, sir. Right. Well, I got Christ. I don't need anybody else. You're mistaken. That's exactly right. It may sound to be a noble thing, but when you're a part of a body, it's to deny the body. It's to make Christ nothing but a big head, David. Have you seen the commercial where you have the horseless headsman? Yeah. Not the headless horseman. <laughs> and there's a great old big head on his little teeny body. And once he eats him a Snickers bar, he, you know. That's the way some people want to view Christ. He just this great big head. As long as I'm connected to him, it don't matter. No, we're in a part of a body. Why? Because God structured it that way. God has arranged it that way. God has ordered it that way. And to think any other way is to say there must be some better way. And there is no better way. Why? Because God said do it this way. Yeah. He said I'm doing it this way. That's right. Fourthly, there is a common theme of coherence and union. Turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Only let your conversation, and that means more than what we say, <coughs> has to do with your the whole of your life. Exactly. Only let your conversation be as becometh the, the law of Moses. Is that what it says? No, that was a different version. I must have been reading that one. Like, only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. Amen. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind. You see the union, the coherence there? You see it? Doing what? Striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now the first priority of the body in the body, Mason, is to defend the body. That's the first priority of the body. In the body is to defend the body. And that's why in Ephesians 4, the first thing, remember I, we went over that in detail, This the oneness the first thing that these gifts, these men, gifts given to the church, the first thing was, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. There you go. You yes, see sir. that? For the perfecting of the saints. In other words, the church, when it comes to things in this world, the church is number one. When it comes to things in this world. Well, I, I, my, my community comes first. No. That's right. No. My marriage comes first. No. No. Your marriage is of a high order. Yeah. But the, your marriage doesn't come first. God sometimes splits people up. You remember he killed one woman's husband and his name was Nabal. And she said, he's a fool. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Huh? When David, David came in and she went out to entreat David because she knew David was going to take his head off. Well, God ended up killing him anyway and he was out of her hair. And David ended up marrying the woman. Now... Go figure that one out. Let that be preached at the First Baptist Church in downtown Beckley. 
Well, what are you saying? I didn't say anything. I just told you what the Scripture says. There you go. Striving together for the faith of the Gospel. But as I've pointed out, let us never become so complacent that all we do is try to protect ourselves. Let us take this battle out here to the enemy because there's some of the members of the body that are still stuck out there. Yes, sir. They're still out there. They're still behind the walls of the citadels of man's pride and rebellion and false religion. And they need the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. They need, they must have yeah. the gospel. Well, it don't matter. I just wait for God to bring, bring them to me. Whoa, no. Whoa, no. Is that what Jonah did? Well, I just wait. Well, Jonah, if you want Nineveh to be all right, you send the kings there to me. No, God says you go to them. It was the Ethiopian eunuch. God could have easily have sent him and left him in Jerusalem. Yes, sir. He'd just been in Jerusalem. Exactly, yeah. God had sent him out of Jerusalem. Why didn't God keep him in Jerusalem? Because yes. God was pleased to send. Yeah. Send. Yes, and that's what God does is send. Yes, sir. He sends. See, it's not this. We're going to sit here, and as long as God brings, you know, maybe they'll come in here every once in a while. People out yonder ain't going to come here to listen to us. The only place we're going to have any contact now is to take it out there. That's it. Take it out there. Oh, yeah. Can God bring somebody here? Yeah, oh, yeah, He can. But usually He only brings them here once they've been attacked and assaulted by the gospel <laughs> and conquered by the gospel out there. Yeah, that's right. And then they say, I want to go over yonder and hear what that's all about. Yeah. <laughs> I think I need to join up with those folks. Mm -hmm. No, there is a common theme of coherence and union. And it's summarized that striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, I know some people become a little perturbed, but all y'all people talk about, though, is the gospel this, Christ that, this gospel that, because that's the whole of this message, the whole of this book. Yeah. All points to Jesus Christ, and that is the gospel. Yeah. Right. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God unto salvation. Unto everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. In other words, my word shall not return, turn me void. Everything we do by the enablement of the Spirit of God will accomplish exactly what God Almighty ordained for it to accomplish. Even if it hardens some. Even if that's all He does is harden Everybody that hears it. There you go. That's it. I don't necessarily, David, like, I, I want to see some results, some positive results. Positive. I want to see these. Yeah, there you go. But that's God's business, is it not? Sure. That's exactly right. If God breaks down a citadel, because He's structured and arranged and ordered to do it, if He leaves that citadel standing, yeah. that's His business. Yeah, exactly. That's His business. Fifthly, our union has eternal weight. Turn to Romans chapter 8. This union I'm speaking of has, has eternal weight. Romans 8. <coughs> I'll have this, the last part of this is going to have to be another message. I wasn't planning on it being, but that's alright. It's kind of hard to preach after a message like Joe preached. I, I, I would just as soon sit down there and not have to say anything else. Got another scripture reading and been done with it, but be that as it may. Romans chapter 8, I'll begin at verse 14. Let me say it again. Our union has eternal weight. Romans 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of, do of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I will use part of Joe's message. That prodigal son began to fear first. Yes, sir. He fear, I perish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I thought y'all people believed that the elect wasn't going to go to hell. They're not going to go to hell. No, but they know they deserve to go to hell. Yeah, exactly. They know had was it not for God's mercy and grace, they ought to go to hell. Yes, sir. And if they're not really one of the elect, even though they may think they are, they will go to hell. The first thing God does is bring you to see the very bondage you're really in. Yes, sir. That's the first thing. You know, even 
Darwin Pruitt mentioned it yesterday. He said the gospel won't even make any difference to you until God Almighty shows you what you really are as a sinner. That's right. And that's the truth. Yes, sir. For you have not received the spirit of a bondage again to fear, again, but you've received what? The spirit of adoption. And that, that, that prodigal son said, I'll rise and go to where? Yeah. He wasn't thinking about the Father before. He's thinking about himself. But he said, I'll rise and go to the Father. That's right. You know? Now look, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. Yeah. And joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be glorified, also glorified, what? Together. Yeah. Yeah. You see it? Together. Amen. Well, as long as I make it to heaven, that's all, that's, uh, that's all that matters. No, uh, if we don't all make it, then God Almighty is a liar. That's exactly right. Now, you hear what I said? Yeah. If we don't all make it, the whole body, Amen. the whole church, Amen. every member of that body doesn't make it. If one member was to fall outside, Joe, then God was a liar. Yeah, that's exactly right. God was a, but God cannot lie. Amen. We shall be glorified how? Yeah. Together. Now think, I said our union has eternal weight, and it will be gained, not by bits and pieces, one here and one there. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 4. Now you know what this is, verse 13. First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. This is the passage that most modern day premillennials will use to try to scare people to make a religious decision so you're not left behind when Jesus comes again. There you go. Right? Mm -hmm. That's not what this passage is for. No, sir. no way, shape, or form. Look at it, First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant. Why? Because there's structure. Yes, sir. There's order. There's arrangement here. Yes, sir. But I would not to have you have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even the, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, and that word would be better proceed, yeah, let's right. go before, shall not precede them which are asleep. Yeah. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise, what? First. First. Yeah. Then, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, you see that next word? Together. It's not they're going to go up there and then we we got to sit around here and mill around and so say, I wonder what's going on now. According to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, it's going to happen like that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. In the moment, mm -hmm. in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. The dead's going to, eh, the trumpet's going to sound. The last trump will go forth, Joe. The dead in Christ, the ones that he's been yes, brought sir. with him, they're going to be raised first, but it's going to be so quick. That right after that, in a millisecond, if I can say so, with reverence and all, yeah. in a millisecond, those of us who are alive and remain will be changed and we'll all go up how? Yeah. Together. Yeah, you see that? Yes, together. Now, where was I at? Yeah, together. Uh, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And why do we teach this? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. In other words, God ain't going to leave none of us behind. Amen. In the ground dead, That's right. in literal language, or alive That's right. and remaining. Amen. He ain't going to leave none of us behind. I mean, the Left Behind series is a misnomer. Yeah, there you go. It's a misnomer. Yeah. They're, all, they're, they're worried about the ones that going to be left behind. The ones that are going to be left behind are going to be left behind no matter what. Because it's meant for them to be left behind. Yes, sir. The ones that's supposed to go up, they're going up. Amen. And they're going up together. Amen. Hmm. That's it. I like that because I know yes. I know if God takes you and I'm like you are in Christ, He got to take me too. Amen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. yeah. When this happens, if you're in Christ and I'm in Christ, He takes you, He got to take me too. That's exactly he right. promised he yes, to sir. do so. Amen. That lets me say. Amen. 
Because I don't want to be left behind. There you, go. you don't want to be one of those that's left behind. No. But if you are, you're a goner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm going to have some of this up and just let you have a little taste of God will next time. Think of this. The heavens, the Scripture says this, the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. Now, I'm intrigued, and I know this is this, this, this. I'm intrigued when I see these pictures of NASA of these distant Joe galaxies. Oh, yeah. I mean, a whole nother galaxy. Yeah. You know, you we look at it with the naked eye. And it looks like one star. Yeah. It's not just one star. It's a. This is what they say. That's a whole nother galaxy out there of billions of stars swirling around in different. Configurations, but swirling it around the central mass. But in all of that, that, that intrigues me. I just look at that now. I'm like, why? Because it just no. Because I know my God did this. Amen. And it lets me know that in the scheme of things, I ain't nothing. There you go. All of that distance out there, and I'm this little speck of breathing flesh and blood and bone. All this, and yet God sent His Son to this terrestrial ball yeah. for little specks like us. Yeah. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God. And one of the ways that this is seen is in its organization. Its arrangement. Its order. Yeah. That's right. We look out there and you know we might say, well there's an explosion of this or of this or that, but there's still arrangement mm-hmm. and order. I mean, everywhere we look, even David, every one of them galaxies, they don't find we're just doing this. That's right. They're all doing this. All of them. And then they're doing this. Now, yeah, they say they collide every once in a while. We don't know if that's still happening. They, even they admit that, that took place could have took place billions of years ago. See, we don't really even know if them things are still out there. That's true. Have you ever thought about that? Mason, if it takes so many millions of years for that light to get there, what's out there that we're seeing now may not even be there now. There it go. may have done went... There you go. But here's the whole point. Our God holds all this together. Amen. We keep going around our sun because God Almighty said so. Mm-hmm. When that sun spews forth one of those solar blasts and then particles hit the northern atmosphere and they see those lights... Those northern lights. Think that's God Almighty doing those things. Yes, sir. But it's all structure. Yes, sir. Exactly. Even the eternal purpose of God in Christ, which was all in God's mind at one time. Yeah. God never has a new thought. Yeah. God doesn't plan one thing and say, hey, this will work good with that. Yeah. We think that way because that we're finite creatures. God never thought that way. Yeah. It was all predestination, election, redemption, regeneration, conversion, perseverance, resurrection, rapture, all of it was in the mind of God. And I can't even say at one time, at once, if even that's the most appropriate way to say it. And yet, and yet that God has spread out before us this very eternal purpose with order. He gives it to us in an orderly arrangement. Amen. And we see that clearly presented in Ephesians chapter 1. Now you know where I was going with all of that. And I know again, if it wasn't for Ephesians chapter 1 and Romans 9, we'd have no basis for what we believe, would we? Well, wait a minute, isn't that enough? I mean, you know, people say, well, you always go to that. That was actually said about me. I always preach from Romans 9. I wish that I would do that. If I thought you all would get tired of it and quit coming, I'd preach from Romans 9 every Sunday. There's enough there to do 50 lifetimes of preaching. Yes, but be that as it may. Think of it though, what I'm saying. The eternal purpose of God, which was all in the mind and purpose of God at once, yet God lays it out for us creatures with order and structure. Yes, sir. Isn't it amazing? Why? Because he wants us, no, no. He has purpose for us to know these things. 
to comprehend with all saints. Yes, Isn't that what he goes on, Paul goes on to okay. say? Uh, what it, Joe, you preached on that here. The eye, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. God has been pleased to reveal to us yes, sir. this beauty and splendor that's all in himself at one time. Yes, sir. But Mason, for him to do it, he has to lay it out for us with structure mm -hmm. and order and arrangement. Yes, uh, we just There's no way we could even fathom that even began to comprehend it apart from that. Now let me tell you, let me give you this, and Lord willing, we'll look at it next week. This, what's this beauty and splendor? <coughs> God the Father, and we'll look at it, God willing, in detail, but I'm going to give you these seven things. God the Father, in chapter 1, verse 3, hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He hath. Amen. Whether, yes, sir. see, where he says, I pray that you comprehend it. Say, I don't understand that. It's because it's impossible to get it all at one time. Or no, comprehend it all at one time, even though it's been given to you all at one time. Yes, sir. He hath blessed us. Not is blessing. That's right. Hath blessed us. But there's a preceding cause. According as. Amen. Verse 4. Amen. You see it? Yes, sir. According as. He chose us. But even the election had a precedent. Oh, yeah. you did know that, didn't you? Uh -huh. Having predestinated in verse 5. Yes, sir. So God gives us, actually, though he mentions election first, the predestination actually preceded the election in God's order, in God's arrangement. Now, it's not that God, see, I said, we think, well, he predestinated, then he said, all right, who am I going to choose to do that? That's not the way God works, but that's the way it's presented to us. Oh, yeah. But having, having predestinated, and it's not until these two, or actually three, blessed us with all spiritual blessings, according as He chose us, having predestinated us, and then He said, listen, you had to be redeemed and forgiven too. Amen. Huh? Yes, sir. Think about that. What's that tell me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, it looks of Christ. Oh, yes! You know what that tells me? There was going to be a problem with us. If God had to purpose this redemption and forgiveness, Mason, then something was going to go wrong with us. Not wrong with his purpose, and his purpose, but something went wrong with us. You know what went wrong with us? We fail in Adam. Yes, sir. Remember that father said, my son, which was lost. That's right. Lost. Redemption. And then he says, what? But this flow, redemption, what flows wrong? Wherein? Verse 8. Just that word. Where in? And from this flows what? The gospel declaration. You also trusted, but you didn't trust until what? After that. That's right. Well, I, you know, I trusted the Lord, and then I, I came to know the doctrines of grace. That is not the way God does it. You're right. It's not. You don't trust until after that you hear. Hmm. And then we get this summarization by Paul. This arrangement has its effect. In verse 15, he says, Where for? <laughs> Where for? Now, God willing, next week we'll look at some of those things in detail. Father, be with those who weren't able to be here today for whatever hindering cause or reason, Lord, and comfort their hearts and minds. And Lord, give them some sense of peace and normalcy even in their bodies, Lord. We pray this as finite creatures, Lord, knowing, not knowing what is best for us, but putting our petitions before you. But Lord, in all things, bow us, bow us to your sovereign will and bow us down joyfully in Christ. It's in his name I ask these things. Amen.